Uh, Carolina, you tell me when we're ready. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Good evening, everyone. Thanks uh, for being here. Thanks for joining us in person. Also, uh, to those of you who are joining us online, um, this is the LSE School of Public Policy. My name is Andres Velasco. I'm a professor of public policy and the dean of the school. And this is an event jointly sponsored by the LSE European Institute, by the LSE School of Public Policy, and of course, by Corvinus University in Budapest. And the title of the event is Emerging Europe's Chronic Distrust, Lessons from the Region's COVID Puzzle. I will not attempt to you know, summarize the gist of the, of the book, uh, uh, that we're discussing, but you will not be surprised to hear that uh, there's a growing and fascinating literature on, you know, as a public policy person, I can say this, one of the things that we kind of knew all along, but we know better now, is that um, trust is a very big determinant of what works and what does not work in the realm of public policy. And uh, I, I do not want to guess what uh, the conclusions of today will be, but I would venture that one thing that we know is that, you know, in countries with high levels of trust, policies tend to be more effective. People trust the government, and as a result, trust what the government has to say. Um, you can imagine uh, the rest of the story. And the opposite is true in countries with a long history of distrust. And of course, in Central and Eastern Europe, trust is... Um, something that people aspire to, but it is not always there, uh, given the reasons, uh, you know, the, the, the region, sorry, uh, somewhat traumatic and, uh, uh, and changing political history over the last, uh, over the last century. So, um, you know, we should not be surprised that trust is not necessarily as high as we would wish it to be. As a result, this provides uh, a huge, um, a huge challenge for public policy. So we have uh, some great speakers, um, and I'm going to mention who is joining us today, and then I will um, stop talking and hand it over to the people you came here to hear. So we have um, Christopher Dan, Joan Costa Ifont, Piroska Nagi Mohaxi, and Elod Tokac. Um, and um, we're going to hand it over to them in just a second. Before I do that, let me say that uh, if you are tweeting, and I hope people are tweeting, I used to tweet once upon a time, but I'm trying to give up the habit. Um, the uh, hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE public policy. Um, for those of you online, if you'd like to ask a question when we come to the Q&A part of the evening, please upload your questions in the chat or in the Q&A function. And, um, at that point, we can um, we can take your questions. Okay, so uh, let me uh, introduce the, the people who will be um, saying all the important things tonight. Christopher Dam is a PhD student at Stanford in the political science department, and before that, he was a pre-doctoral fellow here at the LSC, uh, where he worked for the great Tim Besley. Uh, Joan Costa Ifont is a professor of health economics and the team leader of the Aging and Health Incentives Lab, and a faculty associate of what at the LSE we call the Triple I, the International Inequalities Institute. Uh, Piroska, um, who may be familiar uh, to many of you because she has long been associated with the LSE, is a visiting professor in practice at the um, LSE Firoz Lalji Institute for Africa, and of course, before that, she had a distinguished career at both the World Bank and the IMF in Washington, D.C. And Ella, to my left here, is uh, the rector of Corvinus University in Budapest. He's also a um, visiting professor of practice at the LSE School of Public Policy. So he's one of us, uh, uh, but he's also, of course, a very distinguished uh, Hungarian academic. Uh, before that, he was the chief economist at the BIS and a researcher at the Hungarian National Bank. And, you know, I could go on and on and on, but I will I will skip the rest of the very distinguished uh, CV. 
So if I can find uh, my notes um, of where we go next, um, I just have to remind myself who, who speaks in what order, but I can't find that. I believe Christopher is right, right? Um, where where are my notes on on the order, Carolina? Can you remind me of what? Um... Elod goes first, of course. Um, so Elod, the floor is yours, and then we will um, then we will turn to the other distinguished members of the panel, and then we will uh, turn to the audience. Without further ado, welcome to the LSE. Floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, Andres. Uh, do I have to turn this on? Or I think so. Um, no, no, it's actually no. Okay. It's, it's working by itself. All right. So you see the, the slides. We do indeed. Yes. Four sides. So the book that we came to introduce, and you have a few copies still over there, uh, was edited by uh, Piroshko and myself. And the title is Emerging Europe's Chronic Distrust and Lessons from the Region's COVID Puzzle. So you see the book here. And what is this puzzle? What is the puzzle that we look at? The puzzle is that. Emerging Europe, and I, let me show you a graph here. You can compare emerging Europe and advanced Europe. And what you see in, if you compare the two, in advanced Europe, in the first phase of the COVID epidemic, there were much higher COVID deaths in Western Europe than in Eastern Europe. And around mid-COVID, this thing completely turned around. And the death rates climbed up much, much higher. This is the, the red line that you see on the graph in emerging Europe. And the question is why? Why could this happen? Because if you think about economic development, economic development was the same. Think about healthcare services. Yes, but the advanced Europe has better healthcare services than emerging Europe. But well, that didn't change either. There is a kind of puzzle. What makes such a shift mid-pandemic, what, what can cause a pattern like that? And um, what, can, what can explain this changing, changing the pattern? This is what we are after. But we have a differential effect in different stages of the pandemic. And the lead uh, explanation for that is what we call a trust deficit. Uh, this is what we call the double-edged sword. What happens when you do not trust? You don't trust the government. You don't, don't trust the health care services. There's a pandemic. What do you do? You hunker down. You don't meet with other people. And that helps. In the pandemic, not trusting other people, staying away from other people, is actually pretty good for you. But there is a game changer. Now you have vaccines. The problem is you still don't trust the government. You don't trust the vaccines, so you don't get vaccinated. What is the impact? You die. You are more likely to die because you do not trust. And that's the differential, big differential impact that we seem to emerge. Of course, the picture is a bit fuzzier than that, so I'm making it uh, look a bit stronger. But that's the picture that we see emerging. And there are many other things like social infrastructure, lack of in-crisis adaptation and learning. You don't see like reach out to minorities, because you know, if minorities don't pick up vaccinations, then you might try other channels. You use uh, civil uh, uh, society, use NGOs, and that doesn't happen either. There may be policy mistakes. But the big thing seems to be the trust deficit. And um, please don't be speak about uh, the first lead paper, which conceptualizes this. So I will be, I, 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 won't, I won't steal the thunder. Uh, let's, let, this is where so Chris, Chris and Tim Besley's paper is where we start this journey mm -hmm. intellectually. That trust might act differently. Not trusting others during the pandemic is good for you because you stay away. Not trusting other, not trusting the vaccines will hurt you really bad. Mm -hmm. And one question is, and and the explanation first proposed that this might be the communist dictatorship legacy. You know, the region had forty years of governments systematically growing after civil society, destroying trust, destroying the civil fabric of society in order to control these societies more. Like you know, any decent totalitarian uh, regime, having a 40-year run at that could have that impact. 
So one idea is how, how can we identify that? How can we get a bit more evidence? Is to look at countries which are treated differently. If you compare East and West Germany, same country, same has services. What you see is that the vaccination uptake in East Germany lags well behind West Germany. The same people, same culture. They even looked at the same television during communism times. They react very differently. Another way, and Juan will talk about that one, so I'm not stealing the other show. You can look at another other experiment. You can look at Eastern Europeans or emerging Europeans in London. Mm -hmm. They are subject to the UK health services. They are watching British news. They behave differently. They don't trust. So there are these signs that the trust is missing in the region. And Benze, Benze Shagwari has a nice paper when documents drivers of trust. And what emerges is that it doesn't matter what kind of uh, trust measure we use. You can, there are interpersonal trust. Do I trust my neighbor? If I go to a dealer, do I trust the dealer that I get a fair deal? In a business transaction, can I do business with somebody not related to true family? So that's interpersonal trust. And there's institutional trust. Can I trust the government? Can I trust uh, the church? Can I trust healthcare services? Now, the thing is that the region scores pretty badly on both measures. So there's not much difference. The trust deficit is pretty deep and it's pretty, pretty constant. So there's not much change during the pre-pandemic, post-pandemic surveys of trust. And Attila Vidak documents um, how societies fared during the COVID pandemic and shows that in the first and in the core quotes, high trust, low trust countries, high trust countries are the green ones, low trust are the red ones. And what you see on comparing the first, second, third period of, of COVID-19, that in the first phase of COVID, there is not much pattern. If anything, you see high trust countries suffering pretty badly. Sweden is pretty high up. But what happens after each successive graph, you see the red ones climbing, the low trust countries climbing to the top visually. Yeah. And of course, it's a crude measure to say one country is high trust and is a low trust, but that's just a visualization how you can see the impact of the, of the trust coming through. And, and this is interpersonal trust is, is the answer to the question, do you trust other people? Yes, but, but actually the difference is not huge. So the mm -hmm. picture wouldn't be that much different from institutional trust. So we, we presented um, the book uh, at the IMF, at the International Monetary Fund. And one of the responses was that actually it's weird that people don't, that tr the lack of trust is so deep because in, they said the Latin American countries that you are the judge whether they are right or wrong or that. In Latin American countries, people don't trust the government. Say, well, the government does fishy things, the healthcare services. Mm -hmm. But they said, vaccines are coming from America. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Emerging Europe, mm -hmm. vaccines are coming from America. They're coming from advanced Europe. Still, we don't trust. Mm -hmm. It's a bit deeper than that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Laszlo, Zoller, uh, Gergetot, and Bolage looked at the vaccine allocation and looked, looked at some evidence. and. But they made an argument that when we think about vaccine allocation, you the difference that was made in the in the region was according to vulnerability. You try to vaccinate the old first, and after that, you don't prioritize that much. And they make an argument that actually vaccinating on-site workers who are typically, by the way, lower income than, than those people who can do their job online should be a priority because that limits the economic damage and also guarantees care for the elderly. And finally, uh, Zoltan Adam and George Hoynal uh, wrote, I think, a nice but not very traditional like, economic paper in the sense that I asked them to speculate mm -hmm. for the sake of the book. And what they, what, um, what the argument that they make um, based on, on, on a pretty much a literature review is that the problem is a bit deeper than communism. Communism is the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. But if you think about the history in the region and and um, think about uh, Timothy Snyder's book, The Bloodlands. You think about how brutal World War II was, how brutal the Holocaust was, this region where most of the deaths was. This is now Ukraine. This is now Belarus. This is today's Poland. 
Uh, you had the Holodomor in the region, six million Ukrainians dying in Stalin's Soviet Union in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. So actually there's a might, and, and the history goes even deeper because the region sits somewhere uh, in between big powers, Prussia mm -hmm. on the one side, uh, from the West, the Habsburg Austrians, which was a big power at that time, and on the East, Russia and the Ottoman Empire. And the region is trying to survive and trying to adjust a situation where your autonomy and your local decision making is not that strong. And they argue that distrust, this, the, the level of such a deep level of distrust that we observe in the region comes from a very long history. And to conclude, um, you can learn something from this COVID experiment that we have some suggestive evidence that this lack of trust might have mattered in the region. It acted as a double-edged sword. We don't trust each other. It's good when a new pandemic hits because everybody hunkers down. But when vaccines are coming, this is a total catastrophe. The bigger question is how to build this trust, how you want to increase uh, the government's impact. But you might say, and uh, let me part with this thought, that matter. this doesn't matter. COVID is over. I got COVID last month. It was like a flu. I recovered. I came back. I don't care about COVID. I don't care about your book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I say, you should still care about my book, even if you care zero about COVID. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, the reason is that it tells you something about the region. And this region is not very well understood. This lack of trust is pretty deep. It will affect the kind of economic policies that will work in the region. And for sure, we have one big task ahead. So after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, mm -hmm. we will have a big rebuild. And the success of that one will depend on understanding these characteristics of the region. It will depend on our efforts to rebuild civil societies and to this degree possible rebuild task trust. So my parting thought is that even if you completely do not care about COVID, the book might be still interesting. Thank you very much. I could not agree more with that. Uh, yes, I think it deserves a part of the I could not agree more that uh, trust is fascinating beyond COVID. Uh, I mean, it's hard to think of one public policy where trust does not matter. And certainly for politics, it matters a lot. I have lots of questions, but I will save them toward the end. I, I, I cannot resist uh, 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 making one comment, however. Where I come from, you know, we like to say that poor Uruguay is between Argentina and Brazil. You couldn't find a worse location. But if you think about it being between Prussia and Russia, must be worse, right? Uh, 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 <laughs> Hard to imagine a worse location than that. Piroska. Piroska is the other uh, editor of uh, the book, of course. The floor is yours. And great to see you, Piroska, even if it's only on the screen. Thank you so much, Andres. Uh, very much appreciate the invitation and this possibility uh, for, for the authors to, to present uh, the book. Um, in my uh, short comments, I will focus on the first part of the COVID crisis management in emerging Europe, which was actually, as Elwood uh, described, was quite successful. Relative to advanced Europe, um, emerging Europe fared very well. Caro, could you please uh, put on the slide, uh, the first slide for me, just to underpin this. You already heard um, and uh, so, so you, you already uh, saw the, uh, the uh, chart uh, concerning the, the death difference uh, sort of over time uh, between emerging Europe and, uh, and advanced Europe from Allard. Uh, this is the same chart on the right hand side actually coming from, uh, from, uh, from uh, the Dun and Besley uh, uh, quarter um, paper. Um, so I will focus actually on the uh, success story uh, in terms of, um, you know, the simple measure is uh, GDP uh, growth or the uh, shallowness or the deepness of recession that uh, happened in the first phase. Um, and uh, for that, please focus on the left hand side uh, of the slide, the chart depicting growth rates in advanced and emerging Europe. The uh, most uh, left-handed columns are 
uh, the 1950, uh, sort of the pre-COVID uh, crisis five-year average growth rates. Advanced Europe is blue uh, and emerging Europe is red, maybe for historic reasons in the IMF depiction from the data is coming. Um, so what we see that before the COVID crisis, in emerging Europe uh, was uh, recording a little bit higher, but not significantly higher, higher growth rates um, in the face of its catching up to the more mature and, uh, and actually older advanced European economies. But then came COVID. And the big surprise was that the shallow, the, the surprise was that emerging Europe actually um, contracted in terms of GDP only by 2%, uh, whereas advanced Europe's uh, contraction this session was much, much deeper, over 6%. And if I recall correctly, the world GDP contraction was over 3% that year in the, you know, at, during the first phase of the, the, the of, of the COVID hit. So what we see is that uh, very surprisingly emerging Europe fared, relatively speaking, of course, but fared much better. And then the rebound, um, of course, was almost like a V-type, there was a lot of discussion at the time, but almost a V-type in 2031, the old pattern uh, emerges, advanced Europe uh, is a little bit lower in terms of growth rates. So the real, real difference was, was during uh, this COVID um, phase. So what explained this relatively successful um, uh, period, uh, 2020, uh, you know, economic uh, output, uh, outcome? The second slide, please. Hello, next slide. Oh, there yeah, we go. Yes, you. next slide, thank you, thank you. So, um, uh, I will speak to three points, uh, uh, um, more or less, in this regard. And one will take us, just as Elio suggested, take us a little bit outside the COVID uh, crisis, or outside at least emerging Europe, outside Europe. And that fact that actually, for the first time, emerging markets, the good performers, I'm not speaking about the outliers of Argentina and, and others, mm -hmm. but the, the good performers, um, were able to mount counter-cyclical um, policies, macroeconomic policies, counteract the big recession. Emerging markets, and Andres, uh, our chair, is, is coming uh, from one, typically during the crisis pre-COVID, um, would react to a big external shock by um, at, um, balancing, rebalancing the fiscal accounts, and uh, monetary policy tightening to avoid uh, massive capital outflows and, and all, all the com things that uh, come with it with, with the tightening this is often uh, uh, was a recession. Not this time, not this time emerging markets, uh, both in, in Europe and, and, and many outside, uh, were able to, to have ex uh, big fiscal packages um, and also um, do uh, what, what we, we know since the global financial crisis, quantitative easing, a massive uh, monetary expansion. Um, now, these, so this, this was a very, there's a lot of first in, in this uh, crisis and it has hap it happened, it took place without really putting at risk exchange rates, without leading to to uh, excessive uh, capital outflows. In fact, uh, after a first uh, big blip, uh, we recall perhaps in the first quarter of 2020, uh, actually capital inflows uh, more or less returned to emerging markets, uh, partly as a, in search of, of yield. Um, now, emerging Europe, uh, just as the uh, other uh, emerging markets, emerging Europe was able to put in place uh, these um, packages. Uh, but of course, much smaller, and that was typical also uh, across the world, much smaller than advanced Europe. So uh, direct your attention, uh, please, uh, to the uh, graph on the right hand side, where emerging Europe is on the left side and, and, and advanced Europe is on the, on the um, right side. Emerging Europe cumulatively by June 2021 mounted uh, a little bit less than 10% of GDP worth of uh, fiscal support measures. Uh, whereas ad, uh, advanced Europe, the mature economies uh, did two and a half times more, so uh, close to 25% of GDP worth. Obviously, this is a huge difference. So 
Advanced Europe had a much bigger package. Also, uh, now turning to the right hand side of the, that graph, monetary policy in terms of quantitative easing, how much central banks um, were engaged in asset purchases and thus pumping the liquidity to the economy was much bigger in, in advanced uh, Europe. On the right hand side, it's little X which denotes um, that um, close to 20% of uh, GDP actually, worth of, uh, of balance sheet enlargement, purchasing um, um, assets uh, from the economy, mainly government bonds, but actually there were some, some other corporate bonds in some countries, including, uh, including Hungary um, in the point. Um, whereas um, emerging Europe on the right hand side with the little red uh, dot, um, was uh, within actually the uh, the blue uh, blue uh, column was much less but significant still so overall what we see is that uh, that um, uh, the policy packages the macroeconomic support to counter the recession was much bigger in advance europe but we have seen the outcome right the outcome was that actually uh, the recession was much shallower the uh, growth outcome was much better in emerging europe how come and one of the, uh, the surprising findings, I would say, um, um, from the contribution of our IMF colleagues in this column is that the effectiveness of these macroeconomic support packages actually was higher in emerging Europe than in advanced Europe. And that's really surprising because overall, the administrative capacity uh, of these countries emerging Europe is demonstratively lower. Um, you know, trust, as we heard, is, is, is lower. Um, so what, uh, what uh, the IMF colleagues find is that actually there is a diminishing return to fiscal stimulus. Too big a box doesn't buy you more. And actually you can do more with less. Um, according to this um, uh, this analysis, um, and that's a, actually a very sobering and a very uh, kind of reassuring um, thought. I recall, um, uh, Andres, uh, you at the time um, were highlighted very rightly that, of course, emerging markets are not able to to uh, to put such huge packages and, and, and advanced countries uh, um, at the disposal, sort of to, to combat the crisis, and that was uh, very true. But maybe they don't need, one doesn't need, the economies don't need that big a package. Actually, uh, you can do, um, do more uh, with less. Um, why that is, uh, the, there is a lot, <laughs> there's no clear answers, uh, to be honest. Um, uh, but but it maybe this diminishing return to, um, to, um, uh, to a massive fiscal stimulus in a very short period of time um, um, is, 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 is giving us a clue. Now, finally, uh, it is also true that, that emerging Europe in, in several senses had better initial conditions than advanced Europe. Uh, I, I have see, uh, shown that the catch, it is in the, it's still a catching up phase to the, to the trend growth a little bit higher, not that much, but a little bit higher. But more importantly, um, uh, the um, population is younger. Um, so the susceptibility to, to the COVID virus itself uh, was lower we know it now with a hindsight we didn't of course know it uh, then and also uh, the population uh, um, density is significantly lower than in western europe these had the initial better response but of course these were in 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 place uh, in the second um, second uh, period as well when the emerging uh, europe backslided and and uh, and recorded this horrific uh, death rates that actually were, uh, I think, highest uh, um, in, in the world. Um, so um, um, this is where I'm, I'm, I'm closing. Uh, so the bottom line, uh, the message that I want to leave you with that, that um, in terms of economic policies, actually there was a surprise success um, in emerging Europe relative to advanced Europe, um, limiting the, um, uh, the depths of the, of the recession. And that had to do a lot with policies. Maybe one more um, point, because it's important that emerging Europe did uh, benefit from positive spillovers from advanced Europe's huge packages. Um, advanced Europe is the main market uh, for emerging Europe. 
um, the financial institutions in emerging Europe are, you know, broadly based. You know, are, are many of them still based um, in in advanced Europe. So the, the interconnectedness is, is very close. So there were positive spillovers from the uh, big packages uh, uh, in the West. In addition, the ECB for the first time, um, and the Madame Lagarde, uh, I always say that the chapeau is done for her. Really, the ECB uh, came forward um, and um, in, the, uh, in the lines uh, along with the uh, Federal Reserve, provided FX swaps and repos to six emerging European countries. Um, not only that, they, they obviously not in the Eurozone, obviously, because those don't need, but not even the, in the EU, some of them, such as Albania. So the ECB had uh, almost an, an open and unlimited uh, support uh, in, the, in, 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 in the context of, uh, of, 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 uh, of its uh, swap operations, uh, which also had. Here, this is where I, 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 I stop and we can go back to the gloomier part of, of the distrust in the second period. Thank you. Thank you very much, Piroska. Those are fascinating numbers. You know, I'm, I'm a macroeconomist. My, my bread and butter is debt. Um, if somebody had told me that in response to a crisis, Europe would do 25 percentage points of GDP in fiscal stimulus, and the countries that did little would do 10%, you know, I would have asked, you know, what were you smoking? Uh, 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 it was absolutely inconceivable, and there it is. Um, question, of course, is are we going to pay the consequences now? But that's a different discussion. Okay, Christopher, we'll now turn to you for your analysis and your paper. Excellent. Perfect. So uh, before I begin, I'd just like to say thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to be here. It's, it's a huge privilege to be talking about this joint work with Tim Besley, who's obviously a professor in the economics department. Here at the LSE, and it was a great privilege to be to be a part of the, the book. Uh, so this is the title of our book chapter, A Political Economy Perspective on State Effectiveness in the COVID-19 Pandemic in Emerging Europe. Um, so in terms of state effectiveness, the, the more academic term in political economy is state capacity. And, and whilst there are many definitions and dimensions to this, most triangulate on the ability of the state to increase its range of implementable feasible policies. Mm -hmm. So in sort of layman's terms, it's more or less from a policy perspective, the ability of the state to just get things done. And so theoretically speaking, how does that kind of relate to trust um, both interpersonally and with the state? Well, for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to focus on the latter. But um, from a theoretical angle, we can think about the idea being if the state knows that it can rely on trust in citizens um, to, to, to trust the sort of intervention that it wants to pursue, then it's going to be easy for the state to do things. So in terms of a vaccine, if it wants to roll out any sort of health intervention that it believes is sort of salubrious for its populace, um, then it's going to be easier to do that in, in a sort of high trust environment. And in sort of forthcoming work between Tim and, and Sasha Dre, who's uh, at the World Bank, they sort of have a theoretical model that, that shows that in these sort of high trust environments, there's going to be more incentive for the incumbent to pursue effective policies because it knows it can rely on, on voluntary compliance. And kind of economics of this is that if you think about the enforcement cost of a given policy, it's going to be cheaper to rely on levels of compliance relative to trying to enforce uh, something coercively through fiscal sanctions and other sorts of mechanisms. So that's the, the kind of theory, theoretical approach. And, and so we want to kind of take this to the data. So in, in our chapter, we, we basically use the integrated value survey, which is this global survey effort, which is carried out routinely every few years. And we ask about a thousand individuals randomly selected across different countries to um, uh, ask them about their beliefs and their perceptions and their values across different things. And what we look at is um, looking at whether individuals uh, express confidence in five different political institutions. So we focus on government, the justice system and courts, police, parliament, and the civil service. And after kind of developing a, a binary variable as to whether individuals express confidence or don't in these institutions, we use a, a basic statistical learning approach to kind of collapse these responses into a, a, a unique summary index, which we call trust in state institutions. And this isn't explicitly in the book chapter um, in terms of our contribution, but I put this up here for gratuitous purposes to kind of really visualize the trust deficit with respect to trust in state institutions. Um, and obviously you can see for the, for the blue bar, um, about 60% of individuals in the countries that comprise advanced Europe express confidence in 
state institutions, and that's about relative to 42, 43% for the countries that comprise emerging Europe. So you can see there's about a pretty big 20% differential across these two regions. And, and so this is the trust deficit in sort of a, a picture. And, and that is expressing some trust, lots of trust, because these typically the words of, I mean, the questions of gradations, right? Yes, so so we're developing this based on, so there's four different bins, a great deal, um, some trust, none at all, or just right. no trust at all. And so we're, we're going with sort of some or a great deal of, of trust, but it's robust to, to using different variations. Because if you, sorry to interrupt, but if, if you just go for, you know, high trust, those numbers tend to be 20, 25%, not 60%, yeah. right? But, yeah, but the, the, the differential we, we'd still kind of see, but but I, I, I understand the point. Um, so then in terms of connecting this to kind of uh, outcomes during the pandemic, what, what we then do is we plot on, on the y-axis uh, a, a metric of excess mortality. I mean, this comes from Karlinski and, and Kobach's so world mortality data set. And then using our measure of trust in state institutions at the country level, we plot that on the x-axis. And as you can see, even though there's, there's a bit of heterogeneity going on, you, you do see an interesting negative correlation. So what this is saying is that those societies that had high levels of trust in state institutions experienced lower levels of excess mortality averaged throughout the pandemic, and that's relative to countries with lower levels of trust who experienced higher levels of excess mortality averaged throughout the pandemic. But what's also interesting to note is not just the kind of negative correlation, but you also see the kind of clustering of countries. So um, you see a, a cluster of sort of red, which it represents emerging Europe, a kind of low trust, high excess mortality cluster. And on the lower sort of end of the, the y-axis, even though there's some heterogeneity again, uh, you see a cluster of advanced European countries, which is kind of on average high trust, low excess mortality. Um, so then the key question is, is sort of, you know, well, why is there this kind of trust deficit in emerging Europe? And whilst there, there are several factors, which obviously the, the, the aim of the book is to try and explore, um, one of the, the, the key things that, that Elod uh, picked out was that almost all countries in emerging Europe experienced some form of communist rule. And so, you know, in terms of connecting this to the wider literature and the contributions on this, and I've just put some up there for gratuitous purposes for uh, audience members who, who are interested in reading further, there is a large literature across economics and political science, which focuses kind of on the legacy effects of communism and how that's affected uh, certain beliefs and values as a result of experiencing a certain set of extractive institutions. And the idea, at least with respect to trust in, in the state, is that a culture of suspicion and deep mistrust with government was engendered as a result of kind of a repressive set of institutions under the iron fist of a communist dictatorship. And then following on from that and, and kind of connecting this more to, to outcomes, then the key question is, why does this matter? Well, Mar Margaret Levy, who's a political scientist at Stanford, who I also work quite closely with, has written quite at length on connecting trust in the state and trust in government to, to how it impacts voluntary compliance. And as I sort of hinted at in, in the beginning of, of the talk, um, in situations of low trust in, in the state or in government, it's going to be very hard for any type of incumbent to rely on voluntary compliance to be either incentivized to implement effective policies or even to just roll them out effectively in the first instance. And in terms of connecting this to vaccines, uh, which was again highlighted, um, there's plausible evidence to suggest that there is a kind of connection between low levels of trust in the state and low vaccine uptake. So the Financial Times, they, they ran an, an, an article on this where they were talking about you know, vaccine uptake in, a, in a Eastern Europe. And then I'm just sort of giving you a quote here, which states, collapsed socialist systems bequeath deep distrust in government and a lack of respect for rules and the authorities, providing fertile ground for vaccine skepticism. And just to finally give you a flavor of this, again, in, in the empirics and, and in the data, um, Elod showed uh, the, the kind of dynamics of this and, and how there was a differential in the trajectory about during the second wave of, of the pandemic. But what Tim and I do is, well, we now use the European Social Survey to develop kind of uh, regional levels of uh, trust in state institutions across the 16 federal states of Germany. And again, we kind of bifurcate this by East and West to, to refer back to this natural experiment of history whereby West Germany experienced a different set of institutions for a certain period of time relative to East Germany, which experienced this uh, form of communism. And then on the y-axis, I'm plotting vaccine uptake as of March 2022. So, you know, the, the vaccine has been allowed to roll out for about a year at this point. And as you can see, again, this is, this is just correlation and, and, you know, trying to claim causality is, is a non-starter here, but there's still a, a very interesting positive correlation between levels of trust, even within a given country. 
um, and, and uh, levels of vaccine uptake as a type of measure of compliance-based behavior with the state. And again, there, there's, there's also another interesting clustering. We see that the, the blue cluster is sort of West Germany, um, which is sort of a high trust, high vaccine uptake cluster. And at the lower end, we have East Germany, which is a low vaccine uh, uptake, low trust. Is that a, re a uh, regression line? Just a basic regression line. Um, so just you know, to conclude then, so the, the basic argument that, that Tim and I make in, in our chapter is basically to, to suggest that as the pandemic sort of rolled out, and, and, and this was insinuated earlier on, there were initial low levels of trust at the outset of the pandemic, and, and that sort of made the policy response much more difficult, at least with respect to vaccines, um, as the, the pandemic sort of uh, got underway. And so the key question from this in terms of further research that we are pursuing, uh, Tim, myself, and Sasha, is sort of trying to understand how governments, um, not only in emerging Europe, but also globally, how you actually increase trust in the state. And obviously, this will need further unpacking uh, as we go forward. Uh, but thank you so much. I'm happy to take more questions. Q&A. Brilliant. Thank you, Christopher. That's uh, very, very interesting. Um, I hope that when we do the Q&A, we will return to the issue of how you build trust, because as, as, as an exogenous variable, it does some explaining, but clearly it is an endogenous variable, right? Um, and uh, I'm sure destroying it is easy, building it is hard, like most things in life. Um, Joan, over, over to you. Uh, I see your slides, I don't see your face, but you're there, right? Yes, I'm here. Uh, yes, Brilliant. Uh, thanks Thanks for the invite. Um, hope I'm, uh, I'm heard uh, well. Uh, so yeah, um, um, this uh, presentation, my, my talk will very much fit into the, the previous talks. Uh, particularly, it's going to focus on, on trust as explaining uh, inequalities in the access to healthcare in, amidst uh, COVID-19. But my argument is that uh, trust actually could explain uh, inequalities um, uh, in the use of healthcare more widely. Um, so this is part of a, a wider project. We, we, we are now at the process of writing some of those uh, papers up. Uh, a hint of what we were planning to do is in the book, uh, and hopefully you will, you will get to know a bit more um, today. Basically, the argument, the argument I, will, I will put forward today is that, of course, we all know that vaccines are, are an effective tool uh, to mitigate the effects of, uh, of a virus, like a, a in the context of a pandemic, and we know that is vaccinated the earliest uh, exhibited uh, a most rapid, um, most rapid reduction, let's say, in in mortality, and that's that's basically uh, documented. For instance, for the for the UK, now we know that a significant share of the population, uh, no matter what, are not taking off the vaccine, are vaccine hesitant or vaccine skeptical. Uh, um, we just heard uh, about uh, you know a negative correlation between uh, trust and and vaccine uptake. I mean that's that's essentially what what we are actually showing here, right? And uh, we know that uh, this is particularly the case amongst minority groups. So uh, we know that minority groups in the UK are more likely to be uh, vaccine hesitant. And I'll try to uh, speak to that. Right? So I'll show you like some of the results that we are, as I said, writing up trying to uh, measure uh, using evidence from both longitudinal sources, from a choice experiment and a survey experiment, uh, what are the determinants, what are the, the potential uh, triggers of, of that vaccine dis distrust. And so here on, on the, on the left-hand side, you have like, um, you know, data from winter 2021, and uh, it basically documents the share of individuals that had the first dose, uh, but then, and uh, on, on, on the right hand side, you have uh, the share of individuals that had a positive attitude towards COVID 19 vaccine. And interestingly, what you see clearly is that there are two groups. So one is the Eastern European group, as, as, as hinted before, and the other one is the Caribbean group in, in Britain that's simply more of a vaccine hesitant. Actually, uh, you can clearly see a gap between um, them and the other groups, including whites. And interestingly, whites are not necessarily those that are more positive about the vaccine. So for instance, the uh, Bangladeshis or uh, the Chinese uh, ethnic minorities in Britain are actually more positive than whites or, or as, positive, uh, as positive as whites. Uh, clearly, what we see is that there's some ethnic groups that are uh, more um, skeptical about the vaccine. And that's with our data. 
if one looks at understanding society, which is this longitudinal data set in the, in the UK, we basically document the same finding. The problem with understanding society is that it's less, it provides less granular um, um, uh, evidence on, on Eastern Europeans. And we don't observe the Eastern Europeans here, but we clearly see that Caribbeans are those that are more vaccine hesitant. Now, why is that? Why is it that we observe like um, higher vaccine hesitant amongst, among uh, Caribbeans and Eastern Europeans? Well, there could be like a number of explanations. Obviously, there could be barriers to the access to, to vaccines. So there could be practical limitations, travel time, language difficulties. That could well be the case. And uh, we, we basically explore that. Then there could be information uh, differences in the access to, to, to information, access to internet. Uh, we know that minorities tend to rely more on conservative media and uh, uh, perhaps they, they, they trust less uh, widespread media. And there might be actually other structural limitations like racism, poverty, um, income, wage gaps, and particularly access to uh, hospitals and uh, vaccination centers, which tend to be normally uh, in, the, in the city centers or in, in areas that, that, that tend to be, uh, you know, you could argue better off, right? Now, our, our argument, and, and that's basically what, what we are documenting in, 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 our, in our research, is that there are probably what we can call cultural barriers amongst which trust uh, is the most important one that explain this uh, vaccine hesitancy. Um, and that is not specific of, of the UK. Uh, it's actually something we, uh, we see, for instance, in the US. There is clear mistrust toward healthcare institutions. Uh, so, for instance, there is uh, evidence of uh, black individuals with HIV. 97% uh, uh, of individuals reported in a study uh, show that, uh, well, reveal vaccine hesitancy. And uh, basically, the, the argument is that the government was withholding information from them and that they, they would not receive generally the same standard of care, um, you know, if they had COVID, uh, you know, compared to others. So that created uh, mistrust. And on top of that, we know that there are good reasons for mistrust. There is the so-called trauma hypothesis. Uh, there is this famous, uh, uh, you know, study that documents that individuals that were subject to the, the Tuxigi uh, syphilis study, which was a study that basically, um, you know, uh, an, an RCT that basically individuals were recruited to be um, treated for for a syphilis condition and some of them were promised to be to be treated and were deceived and they were not treated and died and that created a significant distrust all the way to today there is a very famous paper published in a, you know, in a very good economic journal documenting evidence of this now what we do is that we push this uh, trust argument and as you can see here we created an index of distrust uh, based on more than 30 questions that we ask uh, to the to ending minorities in the UK. And as you can see here, uh, both Eastern Europeans and Caribbeans are the ones that are distrusting the most, um, uh, you know, UK institutions, including uh, the healthcare system. So clearly it seems that there is there a correlation between, between trust and uptake of vaccines. And then we look at the, again, the correlation between trust and uh, um, positive attitude, in this case, negative attitudes to vaccine amongst uh, different ethnic groups, and we see that there is a clear positive correlation between Caribbeans and Eastern Europeans, whilst we don't see much of a correlation uh, in other groups. If anything, in some groups, for instance, of Bangladesh, we see a slight negative correlation. So it is interesting to see that there is these two groups that are uh, quite different from the rest. Of course, the question is, what is the origin of that distrust? Right? So we, we do ask in, in, our, in our experiments questions, and what we find is that, for instance, 81% of Caribbeans they say that life is harder for people that are of the race compared to 28% of whites or 10% of Caribbeans say that the NHS and life is, so only 10% say that the NHS and life is fair for them, while 60% of whites do. And um, basically 52% um, reveal some negative experience with the NHS compared to 38%. So there seems to be like a good reason to be distrustful. And if one runs a, a regression, and I'm not getting into details, between NHS distrust and ethnic groups, one clearly see that Caribbeans are the ones that uh, exhibit uh, a negative correlation, so are less likely to trust the NHS. And then when we try to explain whether they would pick up a, a vaccine, I'm not going to get into details, but what we do here is we control for past experience using uh, longitudinal data. So we observe the individual, we know how was their experience with the NHS and with the government back in time in 2011. 
what we find is that when we control for that mistrust, the, the, the negative, the, 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 the vaccine hesitancy of previous disappears, right? So it seems that uh, vaccine hesitancy is explained by a, a previous trauma. Now, we, we do explore other things, like, for instance, whether uh, distance to vaccination centers is different or timing or the cost is different. And indeed, we find some evidence that, uh, you know, uh, ethnic minorities tend to live uh, more far away, from vaccination centers, that the timing of vaccine appointments are, is less convenient compared to, 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 to non-ethnic minorities. And generally, the cost to themselves of taking up the vaccine is, is higher too. Right. So there is some evidence that the barriers matter. You know, the question is what to do, what, what should policy do? And uh, here, what, if one looks at the evidence from the US, there's, they, they've tried a number of things. So for instance, there's lots of evidence looking at lotteries, uh, and lotteries don't, lotteries are an, an incentive for people to take up a vaccine. They, they show an overall increase, but it varies across states. So for instance, in Arkansas and in West Virginia, it didn't work. Uh, we know that much, uh, so uh, reminders do, do simply increase uh, vaccination by, 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 by 6%. And we know that in Sweden, for instance, uh, paying a little bit of money, like something like $20, $20 which is not much, it doesn't compensate the opportunity cost of, of taking up a vaccine, seems to increase vaccination by 4%, right? But all this is not really looking at the ending minorities. And, uh, you know, if one looks at ethnic minorities, actually, if anything, what we see is that um, ethnic minorities to vaccinate can actually backfire. In fact, what we see is that uh, it might steer risk perceptions. Uh, and um, on top of that, it is a very significant cost to policymakers. So, so consistently with the previous presentation, uh, you know, it's easier to build up trust and try to pay people to take up a vaccine, right? And on top of that, financial incentives are seen as coercive if my ethnic minorities are generally seen as struggling economically. So it seems like, like putting money on them might be seen as coercive. And in fact, in Britain, if one looks at uh, whether Caribbean uh, ethnic minorities uh, would respond to incentives, uh, the answer that, that we find so far is basically uh, negative. So, I mean, what we find is that they they would, I mean, if we were to offer not wearing a mask in 2021, whether that would get them to vaccinate, we don't see that that's happening. We don't see that travel passes would definitely would increase uh, their likelihood of taking up a vaccine or even paying them 150 pounds, which is like uh, uh, five times what they, or six times what they offered in, in Sweden. It doesn't really uh, do the trick, right? So a number of incentives that we can think of uh, uh, to get people to take up a vaccine don't seem to work, right? So the question is, it seems that vaccination hesitancy or skepticism is driven by mistrust, and most of incentives don't work. One of the explanations has to do with, with, uh, with uh, barriers to access to the to vaccines. And of course, the question, and perhaps that's something we want to discuss uh, in, in, in the discussion part of the seminar, is how to build up trust, right? So one could argue, well, what we could do is just provide information, right? We don't the needs. But actually, the problem is that many of the, these individuals, they, they rely on information sources that uh, might not be true, but feel familiar. So there is this family, familiarity backfire effect. Actually, providing more information might not, might not work, right? What it seems that it does something is um, using reminders and nudges, and especially trying to involve the community leaders, the religious leaders, uh, and more generally, people that are highly trusted in society to convey information. So perhaps that's something that we've learned from the pandemic. The second argument, and I would say that's more of a long-term um, goal, is dealing with uh, significant health inequalities or inequalities in the access to healthcare that are very much driven by 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 ethnicity, right? And uh, you know, in a way, that's that's perhaps what what uh, this pandemic has has uh, in the in the spotlight. And perhaps that's something that we could we could discuss later on. So thank you. That's what I wanted to, to share. Perhaps uh, we can uh, talk more later. Thank you, Joan. Thank you very, very much, everyone. Um, I am going to use chair's privilege and ask first question. Please get ready, uh, everybody, for your questions. Um, I am very interested in the issue of um, how we think trust is formed. And much of what we heard, not everything, is what I would call backward-looking theories of trust. 
um, you know, by analogy to backward theories of expectations in economics. That is to say, you know, if um, if my parents suffered under communism and, uh, you know, 20 years ago, the government in my country was not to be trusted, then I am not, uh, I'm not a trusting sort. Um, and I'm sure there's some of that, right? Clearly, uh, it cannot be a coincidence that um, countries, you know, east of, uh, say, Vienna, seem to um, behave in a different way than countries west of Vienna. Um, but the problem with backward theories uh, uh, is twofold. First of all, you know, they probably don't capture everything. And secondly, if it's all backward, then we can't change it, right? So in order to change it, we have to believe that uh, some of it is forward-looking. Now, if you if you think trust is forward-looking, uh, and if you think trust depends on what you expect the government will do, you can get into situations of, I fear, I mean, it's not, it's not difficult to write this model, um, of self-fulfilling expectations. If I think the government will deliver, and because I think the government will deliver, I have high trust, then I act in ways that make it possible for the government to deliver. And the government says, I delivered, and people say, oh, the government you know, was pretty good after all. So that ends you in a high delivery, high trust equilibrium. But if I get up and I think um, the government will never deliver, well, then I don't get vaccinated. I don't get vaccinated. The government doesn't deliver. People die. And I think, oh, my God, I was right all along. You know, terrible government. Uh, and look at their performance. So, you know, that's an easy model to write. Um, the question to you guys is, how do we think about this? You know, uh, um, and if, 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 if we do have uh, the potential for sort of self-fulfilling prophecies, that would seem particularly difficult to get out, right? Because, you know, there are countries, you know, uh, I don't know that much about emerging Europe, but my part of the world has roughly the same per capita income as your part of the world. And uh, I can certainly think of countries in my region that will remain nameless, which seem to be in one of these, uh, you know, low trust, low delivery expect uh, uh, equilibria. If I, I am, you know, if I firmly think that the politicians are terrible, well, the politicians will act in ways, or I will act in ways that will force the politician to have terrible deliveries, and you can get stuck there, and it's very hard uh, to get out. So uh, that's a puzzle for me. Um, I see other people who want to come in, so maybe instead of um, just uh, uh, suggesting that you guys focus on that, let me take a couple more questions, and then we will return to everybody. Uh, the gentleman right here, the red pencil has been, you know, he's got his hand up for a very long time. So. Um, and, you know, we, we have about half an hour, so if people could try to keep their questions fairly short so that we can have, you know, several rounds, that would be wonderful. I'm sure I'm not a gentleman, but uh, um, I'm interested in this issue because one of the things that I was looking at was not just trust as measured at a certain point in time, which is what um, world value surveys show, but what actually happened in different countries over time with levels of trust in the, in the COVID context. And here the evidence seems to be, from what I've seen, somewhat mixed, but we do know that it dropped dramatically in this country, but I can point to other countries where it did not, and there are explanations for why this might be the case. But this also comes on to the other thing, which is the forward-looking thing, you might have got trust, but we know very well that you know, building up trust takes a long time and destroying trust is something which can take place pretty rapidly and then rebuilding it after. So whatever we learn about trust from this, one of the things we have to take account of is the fact that this exercise in its own right might have actually been trust destroying. And therefore, can we hope to... Um, to, 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 to learn from this experience, even trust losses. Thank you very much. I think a couple more comments. Um, right there uh, in the light blue shirt, and then here in the front, and then we'll go back to the to the uh, speakers. Yes, sir. Is it working? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for the the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I was just wondering whether uh, whether in the, the course of your research, but your opinions in general. Uh, whether the lack of trust uh, was consolidated specifically in public authorities and, and government institutions, or if it also extended to education uh, institutions and scientific institutions. 
And I guess where this question is coming from is that uh, certain countries, such as my own Ireland, um, which had a very high vaccination rate, I think one of the highest in the world, uh, took a very science-led approach. So we, each evening we had the chief medical officer, uh, as opposed to the, the Minister of Health actually coming out and explaining uh, why the government was taking these measures. Um, so yeah, I was just curious whether this uh, was a feature in, in maybe uh, some of the uh, states that had lower vaccination rates, or uh, were they seeing really the public institutions the same as the educational science institutions? So do we distrust only those evil politicians or do we distrust the professors as well? <laughs> but uh, terrifying thought for the professors, right? Um, right here in front. The lovely talk. Um, my question is a broad question to the panel, but I think it precisely addresses uh, something that was crystallized in the slides we're commenting on Dr. Beasley and Christopher Dan's uh, paper. So in your advance, uh, which the point was uh, that communism dictatorships are a strong factor in determining the level of trust in a society, right? And I also see that uh, when you talk about advanced Europe, you also refer to uh, Portugal, Spain, and um, what was it? Yeah, Portugal, Spain, and uh, Greece, which all have been dictatorships, albeit non-communist, and they've joined the European communion, community at the time, mere decade before the fall of uh, the Berlin Wall. So I was just wondering, perhaps, whether there is a strong discrepancy in terms of trust between uh, former non-communist dictatorships and communist dictatorships, and perhaps looking forward, uh, should we learn something from uh, those three countries that are now within the framework of advanced Europe for countries that want to jump into it eventually? Thank you. Great question. So Southern Europe, is it low trust because it had dictatorships or is it you know, low trust for some other reason? I want to turn back to the panel uh, and beseech the panel to keep their answers short so that we can uh, do a couple more rounds. So let, let, let's just, you know, offer, uh, offer the floor to everybody who spoke in the same order. So we'll begin with Elot, and then I know Piroshka wants to say something. We'll get to you in one second, Piroshka, and then we'll go back to the audience. Well, thank you. Let me start with the first question. So I, I believe that trust is endogenous. So trust is not a given. This is not like geography. This is not like a mountain. We develop a response to the circumstance. If you are sandwiched between Prussia and Russia, or the Wehrmacht and the Red Army, right. well, you will end up with having a pretty low trust society. Um, so that's that, but that's a backward looking. But what what can be forward looking? Um, and and I believe that you have to give incentives people to behave differently. You need to have setups. And when discussing these topics with uh, the, the Hungarian economist, sociologist, academic community. Our thoughts center around decentralization of power. Mm -hmm. Because if you decentralize power, give accountability to local decision makers, that's a lot easier to establish trust. Like if you make decisions locally, then it's easier to see, say, how well the money and resources spent because they are not far away, they are not centralized away. But that's, if you look at the actual history, for instance, uh, public education in Hungary, that's not that easy. Exactly that was the motive to decentralize funding of um, public education in the early 1990s. Everybody said communist government is horrible. It allocates resources in completely in accountable ways. Let's give schools to, to local governments. 20 years later, people said local governments are horrible. <laughs> you cannot really trust it. So when the government decentralizes schooling, People just know, okay, that's okay. It can't get really that much worse. Mm -hmm. Now they think that okay, government centralized government is pretty bad, but they are not that keen on going back to local municipality kind of financing. So there is, it's not that it's 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 a uh, it's not as. Let me give you give you one um, personal story of how deep it is. So I come from a family um, which was like an industrialist family. Granddad tried to build up business little by little. Then you get the Great Depression, everything went down. Then you had World War One, everything was confiscated. He was interned, came back. Then it was nationalized, and he lived a life working in the business that he built as an employee. <laughs> now that that left the scar, which was I think actually had many positives because I was always told by said grandparents that you should study. Because <laughs> that's something that people cannot take away. I think study is a good motivation. But studying because people cannot take that away from you 
is actually not the kind of right way to get that. And and how can you how can so your question is and I think that's the important one. How can you break it? I think you have to create an environment when high trust is the right answer. And if you do it and that's difficult for a number of years, people will change the way how they behave. And our our thinking is decentralized. Uh, power in the company. We will go back to the decentralization as the possible answer. Um, you know, uh, Juan is from Catalonia, so of course he will want this decentralization. <laughs> uh, 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 um, other people may feel differently. Um, uh, Piroska, over to you. Thank you, Andres, and thank you for this absolutely fascinating uh, point and question and, and my two cents uh, for that sort of not just looking into the past, but also future, or at least now, right? So there is, um, we, we talked a lot about the communist past, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, you know, the long uh, history of Austro-Hungarian monarchy and, and all that. Um, but there is something very remarkable happened in this region, and that was the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the first, uh, First Cold War <laughs> in a peaceful manner without bloodshed. That was a little bit of a historical miracle. And it's for the first time this, uh, this region got the perspective actually to, to, um, to be democratic <laughs> and to, uh, to link up to the West as opposed to the East, shit, shit away from the Soviet Russian domination and get EU membership. And it all happened. So actually, governments did deliver. So the question is even more intriguing. Because it's not that governments didn't deliver on the biggest promise of the fall of the Berlin Wall. The government did deliver. They led, by at large now, a large part of emerging Europe to the, uh, to, uh, to the EU, 2004, 2007, and we have uh, the membership lined up in Southern Eastern Europe, even for Ukraine, right? So it's not that, and that was the biggest, biggest, you know, across the board agreement, a desire of the population and governments did deliver. And yet we see this distrust. And my two cents of explanation is that how this um, membership has been delivered um, had a very bad taste. Ivan Krasev, whom I, I respect a lot um, as a political scientist. So he wrote a book a few years ago, The Light That Failed, exactly on this point. And his argument was that basically Eastern Europe did copy and paste of what Western Europe had, and that was very humiliating. And in the end, it gave, gave rise to nationalism. To me, it's a little bit simplistic coming from, from, from that part of the world. And my reading would be that the way the transition happened, the uh, denationalization, the, the market economy was, was, was giving almost 100% for good reasons, because there was no other option really, good 100% ownership to foreign firms from advanced Europe. It meant that in Hungary, in Poland, the Czech Republic and Slovakia and everywhere else, um, you know, the, your, the, the bourgeois owners, the capitalist owners were foreign. There was no local skin in the game. And this has been taken advantage by, by you know, and rightly to some extent, uh, by local governments and local opposition and local elites. And that's what, to my mind, one of the reasons why we are where we are. Now it's still backward looking, but I think it's still happening. So until there is a good solution to this skin of the game, um, as opposed to forced solutions, some of it which, which we have seen in, in, in some lead countries there, um, I don't know whether you can really uh, build uh, trust uh, uh, as, as, uh, as much. That's my two cents over. Let me just one sentence about education and one professor's one. <laughs> Humboldt University, East Germany, 80% mm -hmm. of East German professors were fired and were replaced by West German professors. Right. This is Piroska. That's a very good example, exactly. But even if it enhanced quality, it did not enhance trust, right? Big and time. left to a bitter feeling of being left out in your own. Christopher. Because I used to have people whom I wouldn't employ as an assistant, and I found them ending up as C4 professors in the Eastern Zone no. subsequently. No. Um, excellent. So I'll try my best to take each of the questions in, in, in turn. In terms of the first about uh, how trust is formed, like, uh, you know, that, that is the key question. And 
Um, I think it boils down to trying to understand what the actual transmission mechanism of trust is. Do you think it's kind of a, a vertical thing that you pass intergenerationally between uh, from parents to offspring, and so you're kind of stuck in something that, that's more like a cultural equilibrium? But then there's an argument that it's actually about horizontal transmission, so it's about your experience with the macro institutional environment. And so um, the evidence that, that we're, we're currently working on in, in sort of forthcoming work suggests that it's more of like a horizontal transmission mechanism, and though that suggests that institutional performance is, is something that's really important. Um, and, and, you know, in terms of COVID and, and these other big crises as well, to kind of get out of this equilibrium, you could argue that these are also pivotal moments and shocks where that kind of disrupts the, the, status, the status quo and allows uh, uh, you know, politicians and policymakers to, to come up with a new type of equilibrium. And um, that, that, that's definitely uh, something to, that we're looking into, but it's a, it's a very big question to, to kind of answer. Um, in terms of the second question about sort of dynamics of this, uh, yeah, sort of mayor culpa um, in our chapter for due to space constraints, we were only focusing on sort of the, the static aspect of, of trust as it relates to policy. Um, but I would argue, at least in, in the UK um, sort of uh, context, uh, a lot of the scandals that came out of the Tory party and with Boris Johnson, things like Partygate, were definitely determinants of, of lower levels of trust as we see today. Um, and, and, you know, I remember in the, the when there was the Tory party leadership uh, debate, trust in government was the first question that was asked by uh, um, of, of, the, uh, of the candidates. And so, again, I think it speaks to this idea as well in terms of how we build trust that uh, leadership and, and the motivations of policymakers is, is also something that could be pivotal to kind of build trust as we go forward. Um, with regards to the third question about sort of spillover effects on, on other institutions, I mean, um, that's something that we haven't explored, but um, in terms of some evidence to suggest that there isn't too much of a spillover effect, there's a paper uh, by Barry Eichen Green and co-authors called The Political Scar of Epidemics. And basically what they're showing is that during individuals' formative years from ages 18 to 25, if they experience epidemics, that leads to lower levels of trust, which persist throughout their lifetime. But that doesn't sort of spill over to say to perceptions in economic institutions and other types of institutions. So the kind of um, marginal effect seems to be purely political and, and, and not uh, affecting other things. So, um, but, it, but it's definitely interesting to explore the type of spillovers that might've happened in, in different kinds of contexts. Um, and, and in terms of just to, uh, with respect to the, um, you know, the public science advisory and that was happening in Ireland, it also happened here in, in, in the UK. Um, I also think it speaks to this idea that Margaret Levy, um, also at Stanford, kind of talks about that oftentimes you need policymakers to have some mechanism that justifies the policy response. So if you can kind of have certain mechanisms in place that kind of justifies why individuals should be accepting uh, certain policy interventions, and that is also one method that goes back to trying to trying to build trust through, through this kind of uh, procedural fairness and justification uh, approach. Um, and with the final question on, on the dictatorships, I, I think that's a fantastic point. And again, we, we perhaps, again, Mayor Culver, we were defining things a bit too loosely and we could explore that heterogeneity a bit further. Um, but um, I mean, one, one thing I can say is that when we've explored this in the data further, countries such as Greece and Italy uh, we, we see that they have very low levels of trust and that's concomitant with very low levels of growth over the last 10 years. Right. So as it speaks to the kind of institutional performance thing, um, the, the kind of lack of growth and, and stagnation that has been experienced in some of these countries is, a, again, a plausible driver um, of, of low levels of trust. Um, but, but it's a great point and we should explore it further. That's, that's the chicken and the egg problem. Is low trust the result of low growth or low growth the result of low trust? Um, you know, economicians in the room, go sort that one out. Uh, uh, John. Yes. Um, so, yeah. Uh, is, is local autonomy the answer to everything? Uh, well, it, it could be. It could be. But but uh, <laughs> it, it, it is. Yeah, definitely. It, it does help coordination. Uh, so I, I would say that um, I would disagree in one point that even if trust or distrust is the result of some historical event, there are ways to make it up. So you could argue that distrust happens as a result of some inequality. Uh, in Eastern Europe, there were huge inequalities within communist societies. Communism didn't deliver to, to its promises, and, and that created distrust. I mean, if you were like, uh, you know, high up in the, in the system, you would, you would get access to privilege, and, uh, and that created distrust. And I would say the same happened in dictatorships. Uh, the difference is that that inequality in countries like Italy or Spain or, or Greece has declined, has, has, has clearly 
uh, you know, ex exhibiting a, a, a exhibit a reduction, and 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 uh, as a result of that, um, you know, societies are, are more are more trustworthy these days. So you could argue that some of the origin or the seed of the of the of this trust um, can be found in in in, in inequality. You know? And particularly, it's kind of interesting when one looks at data on on vaccine take up or, or or vaccine optimism. Portugal and Spain were amongst the the, the most optimistic um, in the world. Uh, so it doesn't it doesn't seem that and in fact if one looks at trust in the health system Spain is uh, uh, ranks at the top so uh, it, it does it, it does seem that individuals know uh, and can distinguish different institutions in the country and and they know who to trust and who to, who to distrust um, and and consistently they they they, they behave uh, accordingly no. Now, uh, so in the in the case of Britain, for instance, we were saying that the Caribbean uh, uh, minorities are are those most um, more vaccine hesitant, and those, as you probably remember, I mean, would be Windrush generation, right? So, uh, so they've been not, they haven't been treated particularly well by by British society, and there there are ways to actually make that right. So, one could argue of that one could put forward like some kind of subsidy or some kind of compensation, and presumably that might actually end up building trust uh, amongst at least that that community. So there is something we can do. Um, it might have to do with incentives, but we are not finding that like simple incentive, like for instance, allowing them not to wear a mask or, or paying them like petty petty cash, uh, you know, does the trick. One would have to do something a bit uh, deeper than, than, than just that, right? Uh, but I, I, think, I think that this is basically um, what we see. We've done some other work, for instance, looking at Eastern Europe. We have a paper in, in PLOS One coming up now, I think next week. And uh, basically, what 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 we show there is that um, you know many communist countries were exposed to forced vaccination uh, in the past. So that could be one of the reasons why why we see significant big vaccine hesitancy. I mean, being free, being being subject to a democracy, well, you know, being exposed to a democracy means that you can choose whether to vaccinate yourself or not, as opposed to during communism, right? So that 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 could be uh, uh, another explanation. And finally, another study where we look at what explains health system trust. What we find interesting is that during COVID, uh, younger people actually distrusted that younger people that were exposed to significant mortality in their country or the region uh, distrusted actually the health system more, whilst older people distrusted the health system, sorry, uh, less, right? So basically, there is a, a different behavior between young and old that seems quite interesting. And perhaps that's something that uh, you know we could just take as a as a as a piece of information to reflect upon. All right, we have time for a few more questions. Um, in the red striped shirt, please. I'm going to take three or four and then keep them brief, please. We have exactly 10 minutes to go. So we, in 10 minutes, we need to do the questions and the answers. So um, pithy and to the point, please. Um, by looking back in the past, can you say that in the area of emerging Europe now, we never really had much of like a centralized government. Of course, they were put between Prussia and Russia. But uh, um, they had Ottomans from the south and just didn't really have much of a say of government and feel for it. So how much could you say that the current distrust is generational and that it's being pushed onto people? Um, to use like a personal example, I had a friend at a height of the COVID um, pandemic. She's of Eastern European descent. She's Slovakian. She completely thought the whole thing was a hoax and refused to get her vaccine. I debated her about it a lot and then I asked her why do you think this she said because my mom thinks it and I was like why does your mom think it because her friend told her to so you could just say that this distrust goes through people as well as the fact that you said that um people from east like people in Latin America are more likely to trust a vaccine if they're told it's come from America or if it's come from somewhere where they trust the government in and that their distrust is just for their personal place. Whereas you can see that the distrust from the Eastern European community is traveling to the UK, even though they aren't in the government or the place that they should be distrusting. So how do you think trust can be rebuilt? Do you think it has to be re rebuilt on an individual level or can the society make it better for the people? Great, great question. For the record, most Latin Americans got vaccinated with Chinese or Russian vaccines, not Americans or British vaccines, and and we took them anyway. Uh, 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 um, yes, sir, and the blue um, jumper right there. Yes. 
Thank you. So my question is also about uh, building uh, trust or rebuilding trust and whether this could, the whole distrust in the Eastern European region could be viewed as a spectacular failure of public policy since the fall of the Berlin Wall. Because um, even though there's 40 years of communism uh, that preceded uh, what we currently have in the European region, um, has anything actually been done by uh, governments in the past and prevailing governments in the region to actually increase trust? Uh, well, let's say in governmental institutions uh, for now. Um, because, for example, some some of the governments in the region have been standing for a long time. So the regular political argument that building trust is not something that actually gains votes for the next general election is not really applicable, uh, whether you get Poland, Hungary, or even Russia, where governments have been in the same place for a long time. And actually, could we also say that whatever government is in power, and whatever their views may be, building trust is worth it for all of them for the in the long run. So this isn't necessarily a political issue, but it remains a public policy issue. Thank you. We have time for one more question here in the front and then over there, and then we will be done. Yes. Um, so when... Microphone is right here, coming your way. So when trust bids fail, you might reasonably expect that amongst a pre-existing, you know, sort of trustless demographic, um, that level of trust may decline even further. Uh, just wondering, amongst the uh, trust demographics, COVID studies, has there been an updated study or a time series study throughout the COVID period, um, which you might be able to look into that? And if so, um, do you find a sort of difference in difference uh, between the trust, well, less trusting demographics and the trusting demographics you might you just expect a decrease in trust just covid notwithstanding but do you see that difference in difference i have been told that at every academic event somebody has to say diff and diff and you have done so sir thank you very much uh, um uh, right there and then um in the green and then we will go back to the panel please Hey, um, yeah, so my question was whether you've found any evidence to suggest that communities from these emerging European countries that have suddenly become rich, whether wealth affects their levels of trust, because I've seen some cases where it seems like once people become rich for a number of years, their trust then improves. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was just wondering whether you'd seen any evidence of that. So the rich are more trusting than the poor. That's a that's conjecture. Okay. Thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, so I was just thinking about, there is a very interesting book by uh, Maria Kopp and uh, Arpad Krovsky about the Hungarian mental state, basically. And um, they say that the communist rule and the dictator, dictatorship impacted health outcomes and uh, depression rates, alcoholism rates. So um, I was just thinking that uh, the impact of the dictatorship um, which impacted health outcomes might, might have impacted also the death rates, basically, um, because we have still very high like cancer rates in Hungary, for example, um, and chronic diseases. So I would be interested in your opinions in this. Thank you. Wonderful questions. Um, about five questions. We have four speakers and we have five minutes. Um, <laughs> So um, how you will manage that one, I do not know, but I'm going to hand it over to speakers. Um, one minute and 10 seconds per response, please. And let's do it in the opposite order. So Juan, you're first, then Christopher, then Piroska, and then Elod. Right, so I, I didn't take note of all the questions, but quickly I would say there are clear demographic differences in trust. Uh, when one looks at... Um, particularly uh, vaccines or, or, or the NHS. Uh, clearly, younger people were more uh, pro-vaccines uh, and uh, more dis distrustful of the NHS. And that's because they basically were looking forward basically for the pandemic to, 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 to be overcome. So one, one clearly can see that trust is, although you know, it's hard to, to, to build and it's driven, it's very endogenous. It's driven, it's, it's, it builds up on, on objective facts. 
those are, are signals that, that society and institutions that are, that are driving, that are governing a society are to be uh, trusted or not. So perhaps that, that, that would be my, my final point, that uh, trust, although it looks like it's something intangible, it is actually often based on, on some facts that we can operate upon. A rational account of trust. Others might provide a more irrational. Um, not quite sure what the word is. Christopher, over to you. Well, excellent. So some great questions, and unfortunately, given time constraints, that are probably a poor answer for myself. I mean, in terms of the, the, the... Pick one or two, the ones that really puzzle you. Right. Um, I mean, in terms of the, the fourth question on, on wealth effects and, and, and trust, I, I think that's um, a pretty robust finding. And even in the sort of regressions that we run at the, the micro level, it is the case that you know, higher income kind of predicts higher levels of trust, both here personally and, and, in, and in government. And it's sort of not too surprising, given that, you know, the, 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 the other factors that go into that in terms of your engagement with the state is more likely to be higher if, if, you're, if you're wealthy. So um, I, think, I think that that's um, a, a robust finding. Um, and with respect to, um, you know, is, is the lack of trust uh, not necessarily about communism, but the failure of policy since the fall of the, the Berlin Wall? Again, I think it speaks to this idea that, um, you know, with respect to horizontal transmission of, of, of values, um, institutional performance and your experience with certain policy is definitely going to be a driver of how you perceive the state, notwithstanding potential shocks from the past. So um, I definitely think that's an area to explore further. Um, I'm not entirely sure of any interventions off the top of my head that build trust, but, you know, and, and just finally connecting to the to the case of your friend from Slovakia, I think that, you know, citizen engagement, that that is definitely something that um, is potentially lacking in a lot of, you know, hybrid democracies such as those in uh, emerging Europe relative to, to, to advanced Europe, for lack of a better term. Um, and and I, I believe there's a World Bank document in, in 2020 released, and it was said something along the lines of building trust through citizen engagement. And I, I'd highly recommend sort of looking into that if, if you're interested. Thanks very much. Piroska. Yeah, great questions. Uh, maybe a thought uh, and, and, uh, and, and dimension that we haven't um, had them discussed enough uh, today is that the distrust among individuals, the distrust vis-a-vis -vis my fellow citizen is also also very high and the distrust in NGOs is actually, actually higher than distrust in, in state institutions, mind-boggling. Now, of course, NGOs, uh, non-governmental institutions did not exist uh, during the communist time. And they started to reappear and build, build up with a lot of uh, Western support again um, um, uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. But then there have been government policies recently which, which undermined uh, the, the budding uh, NGO um, you know, uh, community. So I, I, would, I would say that you know, how to build trust, how to, how to build how to how to um, not build uh, distrust? Uh, how you uh, when when you undermine um, the local uh, local community formation um, and and NGOs um, that um, doesn't bode well for individual trust and, and ultimately trust in the society. Thank you, Hello, You get to have the last word. Oh, well, thank you. And thank you for the excellent questions. I won't do justice to all of them. I would focus on the Slovak friend thing. And there is a big learning experience for many people in the region that official media tells you lies, truth comes through trusted friends, and that survives. Let me give you just one personal example. 1980s, little alert in elementary school mentions to the math teacher, an aspiring mathematically inclined person, observing seven times eight is a different multiplication, unlike, you know, multiplying something by 10 or five, which is easy. He looks at me and says, yes, you're quite right. A strange tone. That's the way how I figured out that there was a revolution in Hungary in 56. Because that's the way you communicate. Ah. And that survives because that builds in an expectation that truth comes from trusted friends, who doesn't come from official media. I would, just, I would just finish with that. That is a great story. Very, very revealing. And with that, it is eight o'clock, actually one past eight. And please <laughs> join me, uh, everybody, in giving our panel a big round of applause.
I don't know about you, but I'm walking out of here with lots of ideas to write lots of papers. And, but before I write the papers, I will read the book. <laughs> so I invite you all to do exactly the same thing. And please, somebody grab me a copy because uh, um, I have a long subway ride home. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Good evening. This is great. Wonderful. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. I mean, there's so much food for thought here, right? Um, you know, explaining that this is a bit, yeah, oh yeah, we are very